Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now, your host, Dustin Jones. Hello, friends. Thanks for another download of the Senior Rehab Podcast. Today on the show, we have Ryan Duncan. He is a physical therapist and assistant professor from Washington University in St. Louis. I met him uh, via Chris Hines at CSM this past year and really enjoyed talking with him about Parkinson's uh, disease and his work uh, with with people that have that that condition, as well as advocacy in our profession. So this was a really fun conversation, um, and he uh, talks a lot about advocacy and why it's important, why we should all care, but then also what it's like to be in academia and his work with patients that have Parkinson's disease. So enjoy this conversation, very applicable for you, the rehab clinician, and hopefully it will get you to care a little bit about being a voice for our profession. So without further ado, Ryan Duncan. Ryan Duncan, welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thanks for your time this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dustin. I've been a big fan of your work thus far and really uh, enjoy listening to your podcast, so it's nice to be uh, asked to participate. I paid you for that, uh, for, for the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> You're no, going to make I me was, blush. Was, you stop that. <laughs> I was uh, live tweeting when I was listening to Dee Cornetti's podcast. She got me fired up. So She's awesome. Man, yeah. she's awesome. Um, so for a little background for the listeners, uh, I went to CSM and I was there having a beer with Chris Hines and, and you walked up and then Chris, you know, struck a conversation with you cause y'all have known each other for a while and he introduced me to you. And it was one of those moments where, uh, some, some of y'all may have had this, but where, you know, you interact with people on Twitter, but you have no idea. Uh, who they are, or really, you know, what what they look like in person, and then <laughs> you you meet this person, you're like, oh, Ryan Duncan, yes, I remember, you yeah, know, having a Twitter conversation. It was it was just pretty cool, and then we struck it up, and then talked a lot about your work, uh, Parkinson's research, and and just all that fun stuff. So I'm glad you're on the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. It was awesome. Again, the the power of Twitter. I've been I've been involved with it for a, a little while now, and. Uh, the connections that I've made on there have been unbelievable and I've learned a ton from being on there. So that's why I talk with students and try to tell them to at least get involved. If you don't have to actively participate in the conversations, but just the stuff that you could read on there, you can pick up a lot. Yeah. It's, it's insane. Absolutely insane in terms of the benefit of it, which mm-hmm. I know many listeners on the, on the show may not be on Twitter in in the professional sense. Um, so it's hard to really understand, but man, once you start to interact with people, you, you really see how powerful it is, especially for people that are home health PTs. I mean, I, I feel like I have a network of, of resources and I mean, I wouldn't say mentors per se, but people that, you know, I could call up and be like, Hey, I, you know, I'm working with this patient, you know, bounce some ideas off of them. And that, that wasn't the case before Twitter. By yeah. Means. Yeah. And even to another level, um, you know, I was I was at, in Missouri's capital, Jefferson City, uh, for the physical therapy lobby day, and one of the senators that I was going to meet with, she was actually out of the office. So mm-hmm. I sent her a tweet, and literally uh, a minute later, she got back with me with her cell phone number, so I could talk to her. <laughs> so, so the power of this is is quite amazing. That's crazy. That's crazy. All right, so let's uh, let's get into a little bit more about yourself, Mr. Duncan. Could you give us a quick and dirty on your career up to what you're doing now? Sure. So I graduated from Maryville University, uh, which is a smaller school in St. Louis in 2008 with my master's in physical therapy. And uh, immediately after graduation, I started working at Barnes Jewish Hospital here in St. Louis, which is a large academic medical center affiliated with Washington University, which is where I'm at now. Mm. Um, Graduating out of school, I, I wanted to do pretty much everything. I loved outpatient ortho, I loved acute care, I loved inpatient, um, but eventually just settled on Barnes because I knew um, one of my mentors from school worked there, and I, I really understood the path for growth working at a large uh, medical center like that. So 
Uh, I actually worked there for nine months, and uh, one of my professors uh, sent me an email and said that one of the uh, professors at Washington University had an opening in their laboratory for a research physical therapist. Mm. And uh, the pre- professor knew from my graduate school that I was very interested in research and thought that I might at least investigate. Mm. So set up an interview and the day, the next day I had a new job um, <laughs> in research awesome. and uh, mainly focused on Parkinson's. And mm. so that's uh really where I've been at for the past six years um, and have in that time ascended to being on on faculty um, with many different roles in education, clinical practice, and also continuing research. Man. So so when you started uh, that job in in the hospital, your first job, and you mentioned the the path to growth there, Mm Where did you see that taking you? Did you have a vision of where that would take you, say, 10 years down the road in that position? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I think so. They have it was they have a career ladder at Barnes Jewish. And I thought that was cool right away because it it gives you that path to know that you can grow. Mm -hmm. You know, some jobs I don't know that necessarily have that. So it seems like it might be kind of stagnant. But there it was more of an expectation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like. Um, I like going to work every day, trying to be better than I was the day before. Mm. So uh, that's what really sort of hit home with me. Um, the path to growth, I mean, specifically in that institution, it was cool to see because there were a lot of younger people there in leadership. And that kind of resonated with me as well, that it wasn't just the more senior people on staff who were who were overseeing things, that those who were even out of school four or five years were already in leadership positions. So mm. that's that's kind of why I stuck around there or why I chose to work there. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So when mm-hmm. you, you took uh, the, the position at, at Washington, mm-hmm. uh, mainly, you know, as a research position, focusing on Parkinson's disease, what... What were some of the biggest changes that you had in your perception of Parkinson's compared to, you know, going into the job kind of before and after? What, what were some of the biggest changes you experienced? Yeah. So when you when you're in school, we're lucky to get whatever two or three hour lecture on Parkinson's uh, and you learn basically the four cardinal signs, which is tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia and postural instability. And that's about it. And being on the research side, I was fortunate to have times to investigate it much more um, and learning about the intricacies of the disease that these people also have muscle weakness um, that is specifically related to the disease. They have non-motor symptoms um, that a lot of us don't even know about, how lack of smell or hallucinations or things like that that can be very, very debilitating. Mm. So I just learned really that this disease is much, much more complex than we ever thought, and it shouldn't be just limited to the motor problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, in terms of, if you're to kind of summarize the research, um, like let's, let's say the past 10 years, what are some of the biggest changes in how we perceive uh, Parkinson's or what we actually know about it? I think you're starting to see a really big shift in the understanding of importance of exercise. Mm for people with PD. Even six years ago when I started, it was, I wouldn't say it was in its infancy, but it was still gaining traction. And I think even in just that short period of time, it's really become what I would hope to be standard of care. When somebody that goes to a neurologist says that they have Parkinson's, they should immediately receive a prescription to see a physical therapist in my mind. And that's Mm -hmm. what we should strive for. So the research is bearing out the effectiveness of this and the effectiveness um, hopefully should uh, create a paradigm shift in clinical practice in Mm -hmm. that physical therapy should be something that everyone with Parkinson's disease gets across the, across the entire spectrum of the disease. Mm. Yeah, it does seem that that it is uh, recommended pretty late in the game. It is usually, yeah, that's, that's usually the case, you know, wait, we don't, for someone with PD, they spend a lot of years, um, where they're doing pretty well, where they're walking is somewhat okay. And they might have a tremor. Um, and then physical therapy usually isn't, uh, referred to until somebody falls and breaks a hip or 
uh, has significant freezing of gate or something like that. And I think there's a lot of missed opportunities there that we could have intervened much, much earlier in the hopes of at least delaying the onset of those problems or helping someone better deal with them when they do come up. Yeah. So, so exercise is good for Parkinson's. Um, Correct. When, so what does that look like in terms of dosage, uh, in terms of certain types of exercise? Because I've, I've definitely come across several uh, advertising uh, continuing ed courses of these mm-hmm. kind of special uh, exercise routines that are, that are proven to you know, really improve people that have Parkinson's disease and uh, it, I mean, it, I, I'm sure it helps, but it, it almost seems like they're trying to say their way is, is the right way. Uh, what, yep. what does the research say about exercise? I think at, least at this point, uh, you can sort of confidently say that there are many, many uh, modes of exercise that work. So specifically here in our lab, we've done work on tango dancing. And All Dr. right. Sign <laughs> me up. Yeah. I'll be Dr. a partner Dan. to... To, to anyone any day for some tango. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gammon Earhart started this line of research uh, quite a while ago, and it's really taken off, and it's really effective for people with Parkinson's in terms of improving gait and balance and other other motor aspects. There's a lot of evidence to support resistance training, and uh, general increase in physical activity also leads to improvement. So I think to say that there's one preferred mode of exercise at this point, as I think is premature. We're not there. A lot of times these studies study a mode of intervention related to a control group and don't directly compare interventions to say that one is superior to another. Yeah. Um, so again, I think where we are is that many modes of exercise are effective. And I think what we'll try to go forward with now is trying to figure out if one's more effective than the other. Mm. Okay. My suspicion, though, is that, you know, I don't know that we'll see that. And I think there are many other factors at play. And perhaps it's just the fact that, you know, if a patient finds an exercise that they like to do, regardless yeah. of the actual mode, if you push them hard enough, uh, they're probably going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I like that advice, uh, especially considering the, the actual person, you know, that you're working with. Right. and. And exactly. then taking their interest, which you know is is usually the probably the biggest factor in terms of people uh, changing a habit for sure. Right. I mean, um, you have some patients who who want to be at the gym and on those resistance machines, and some people could care less about that, and they'd rather be dancing or yeah. walking. So I think we got to do a better job of fitting it to what people want. Yeah, uh, this makes me think of uh, a listener of the show. Her name, uh, I think, it's Justin Embry, if I'm recalling it correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, and she she's a part of the Senior Rehab Project Facebook group, and uh-huh. she posted a picture. This is a couple of weeks ago, I think, of of her patient. Um, she she's a big fan of the barbell, and she's having this guy do I think it was eighty some pounds of a barbell deadlift, and he was in his eighties. And was just talking about some of the gains that they made, and and she mentioned that he had Parkinson's, and I think between the conversation that we had with Chris Hines and then seeing that picture there with her, it's really had me thinking of, of man, if I get these people moving, I challenge them physically, like, man, we can, we can do a lot of good there. I don't have to get my special certification per se in some special exercise system right, uh, right. To, to get them better, but, but to, to get them moving for sure. Yeah. These, these people aren't fragile. Um, they can do a lot more than you think. Although their motor condition, you know, might look a little bit intimidating, they have a lot more capacity than we might think. Yeah. Um, again, we shouldn't be overzealous with the way we push people, but if we do it in a controlled way, the way that we're taught to do, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's absolutely appropriate. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, you know, you've learned you've learned a lot uh, in that position, I'm sure, and dove heavy into the research. Uh, other than the topic that we just talked about, how do you feel like you've changed as a clinician compared to bef- before this this job in terms of say you have a patient that walks in the door and they've been diagnosed mm-hmm. with parkinson's disease uh what what do you do differently now compared to you know the young ryan duncan fresh out of school i think you're still young uh, by the way yeah, thanks i appreciate <laughs> that i just turned 31 yesterday so happy birthday all yeah, right thanks thanks uh what do i do differently i think um 
being involved in research, uh, and I think I've learned to think better, mm. um, not just come up with a standard sort of cookie cutter plan for every patient, but rather consider the the objective findings and better to come up with an individualized plan with someone. So for example, like I use the mini best test, which is a, a new, rather new balance test that helps us uh, evaluate balance under different sort of conditions. So there's part that's these anticipatory postural adjustments, things like sit to stand or standing on one leg. And then there's uh, reactive postural responses. So I have someone lean into my hands and I let go and then they try to catch their balance. Okay. Um, and then sensory orientation, standing on foam with eyes open and closed. And then the last, which I really like, is the stability and gait where they have pe- where it has people walk but do different balance tasks while they're walking. Mm. And I like that multifaceted approach. So when I go through and I do that test and I go to write my assessment, I can hone in on what areas specifically do I need to work on. So is this more of a sensory problem where I need to be doing work like that or or most of their deficits falling in stability and gait. And I really just need to be honing in on trying to help their balance during walking. Yeah. So again, I think being involved in research, it really teaches you to think. Um, and that's what I feel that I've gotten better at over time, but I'm still striving. I'm not going to stop. I need to get better every day. Yeah. I, I should become a researcher. <laughs> because my, my ability to think critically is, uh, is, is pretty poor. Three sets of ten for everybody, right? Same <laughs> hand out of home right. exercises. <laughs> no, it sounds okay. like you're doing it. You're doing it right. But, no, but that's the sort of thing, you yeah. know. When when a patient, and I think it's also taught me to say, I don't know. So mm. when when a patient, you know, says, "What's the best dose of exercise for somebody with Parkinson's?" I freely admit, I don't know. And I would hope that other researchers would say that as well. Yeah. I have an idea of what works, but that question hasn't been fully answered yet. Um, so I can give them my best sort of evidence-informed opinion mm. um, but to state that as fact or say that you need to be, you know, three sets of 10 is the best is just really, again, not the right answer at this yeah. point. Yeah. And I'll put a link to that that test in, in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. Faye Horak out of uh, OHSU uh, in Oregon developed it, and I'm a big fan. Uh, mostly because the Berg, you know, with a lot of people were taught in physical therapy school and and – I, I still sometimes use that test, but I find that a lot of people are sealing it out. So a lot of people do really well, although I know that they have balance impairments. So I think the mini best test is a little bit more challenging. And also it includes this component of gait, which is not included in the in the bird. Right. Of course, we all know walking is very important, yeah. and particularly for people with PD. So that's why I choose to use that. Okay. Um, I, I have a patient right now that that has uh, Parkinson's disease and the, they're a couple and the, the, they're in their mid to late eighties and the wife is having a really tough time taking care of, of the patient of, of her husband. Mm -hmm. And I've just been trying to think of all the things that that I can do for them. And eating has been a big issue, which, you know, OT is on the case as well. Um, but I was talking with occupational therapists about some of the technology that's coming out to kind of reduce the impact of tremors with certain mm-hmm. tasks, especially eating. And she turned me on to the, the Google utensils. I've heard about that, but I don't know much about it. Do you uh, know more about it? <laughs> oh, my gosh. They're, I just saw the video. I haven't got to use them. If anyone uh, has, has used them that's listening, you know, definitely reach out to us on Twitter. But it's basically a handle. Mm. Uh, and you have interchangeable uh, ends, so you know a knife, fork, and spoon, a sure. spork, maybe I don't know. Um, nice. <laughs> but there's basically an accelerometer. Uh, this is this is me guessing. Accelerometer inside to yeah. where the handle can move, but the the insert remains level. Interesting. Um, well, I, I guess I can't say it's an accelerometer. It's something in there that the, yeah. in, the smart engineers put in there to where they're still the tremor is still happening, but but the insert is remaining stable, so they can you know put things in their mouth and not spill it all over the place. Um, right. And yeah, I haven't got my hands on them yet, but that makes me pretty excited for uh, I guess just kind of the future in, in terms of some of the adaptive equipment for for people that that have those issues. Um, yeah. 
I, I, I'm not as familiar with that, but more in the, the walking and gate area, there's a lot of research going on here, um, particularly with respect to freezing of gate, which is defined as the episodic inability to generate a step. So mm. when somebody tries to turn around and you notice they want to go, but their feet just won't, or they walk through a doorway and all of a sudden their step, their ability to walk through it is suddenly stopped. Mm. They freeze and oftentimes... This is a very, very strong risk factor for falls. There is some research now to figure out if they can use devices to detect if this epi- if a freezing episode will occur hmm. and then subsequently deliver like a sensory cue before it occurs to prevent that. So it might take what? the form of like a shooting a laser on the floor if they suspect that this episode's gonna gonna occur, then that person can try to step towards a laser and hopefully uh, avoid a freezing episode or maybe it takes the form of like a vibration device on the wrist. And if they detect that freezing might occur, they give them sort of a vibrating sort of regular frequency cue and mm-hmm. then they can try to walk to go, uh, prevent that freezing. So yeah, the future is definitely, uh, bright, I think for these sorts of devices and yeah. it'll be interesting to see where we're at. Even, you know, two years from now, I bet it's going to look way different. Yeah. So. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk sure. to you about uh, being in academia, and yeah. you know, you're nine nine months out of or nine months into your first job, and then you mm-hmm. take this research position. Did you have? Um, were you teaching any when you started off at Washington? No. So I was strictly a research physical therapist, um, and I held that position. Gosh, I forget the year now, but I think for about three years, and I think I was appointed to faculty in 2013. So, okay. um, and then even so, after that appointment, I didn't have any role in teaching until about two years ago. Okay. So yeah. So what what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned starting out uh, teaching students? That's a good question. So the one class that I do. It's neurology medicine, and it's essentially me coordinating physician guest lectures. Mm-hmm. Um, so the neurologist will come in and talk about a specific condition each week, so Parkinson's and stroke and all the other courses. So I don't teach as much in the traditional way there. I'm more of a coordinate those lectures. Yeah. The the one class that I do help out in, in the spring semester is this professional issues course, and it's in the last semester, and this has helped. Uh, helps teach students about um, issues that might arise when they when they get out of school. So things related to licensing or advocacy uh, are taught in this class, and I think that's I fit really well there. I think because yeah. <laughs> I'm really passionate about advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, what did I What have I learned? I mm-hmm. think that students are really open to what we have to say, um, and that even you know, taking the time out to just have a a brief conversation with the student, they really, really appreciate that. And so I've learned to try to make it my, my point to know that, you know, just as I know, I try to show every patient that I care about them. I want to show the same to every student. Yeah. How, how are students different now compared to when you were going through physical therapy school? If you see any shifts I think the big thing, and it's it's interesting because I was only, you know, when I graduated, it was 2008. So, you know, eight years ago, is, I guess, could be considered a long time. But I think the technology yeah. piece is huge. You know, when, when I was in school, we weren't even there yet. Nobody was using laptops to take notes. Mm-hmm. And now it's like commonplace. Yeah. So there, it's just one huge difference um, that I've seen. Back in your day, you had pencil and paper, huh? Pencil and paper, right? Yeah, <laughs> I was scribbling down notes on PowerPoint slides. So, yeah. Oh, I know many of the listeners are, are just laughing right now, some of the people that have been in the profession <laughs> for 30, 40 years. Right. I mean, even in 2007, when they were still using the overhead projector to, to learn about the scapulohumeral rhythm and things in kinesiology. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it, it is wild. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I graduated in 11, 2011. And even even then, uh, just in the, what, four or five years, it's it's been a huge change um, yep. in terms of, I think the big thing is the availability of information. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that the students have now. I mean, they if they want to learn something, they can. It's just a matter of, of willpower because there's, uh, I mean, they have access to everything. So right. I've, I've just been very impressed with the students I've interacted with. Granted, most of the students I've interacted with have been uh, active on Twitter. They go to CSM. They're they're very engaged, you know, in their education and, and the profession. Um, so I know I may it may be a little skewed, but my gosh. They're smart. <laughs> they know their they stuff. Are. They are. You're and right. <laughs> they've got all the knowledge, and, and man, when they when they learn how to apply that knowledge in the right context, I mean, they're they're going to be awesome. So I'm, yeah, I know. When I was in school, I was just kind of you know pushing to get through, and I was involved mm -hmm. to an extent, but it seems to be that the, it's to a new level. Yeah. Like their their zest to really you know transform society. Mm -hmm. I think. Is, way beyond what I could have imagined when I was a student. And I'm excited to see what this new generation of PT yeah. uh, holds. Yeah. So let, let's talk about advocacy because you, you mentioned, you know, that you're very passionate about it. I've seen you tweeting a lot about it. Um, I'm just going to play devil's advocate real quick. Sure. Why, why advocacy? What's the big deal <clears throat> about it? Why should I care? When it comes, so who else is going to do it would be my first question. Um, I like this quote that, uh, Lily Tomlin, a comedian, put out, it says, uh, um, I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I was somebody. <laughs> right? That's a good so point. If, you, if you have a problem, go out and change it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make sure that your profession is both stable, but also has the ability to advance, then we need to be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think one other uh, um quote that you'll see going around a lot because I think the students are using this in their national advocacy dinners um, but if you're not at the table you're on the menu so Ooh, I like that right so if we we have a specific issue in Missouri right now where they're trying to repeal our um, law that we have that is against physician-owned physical therapy services and again if we weren't at the table those are gone right mm -hmm. so we need to be there advocating to keep our uh, profession safe and give it the ability to advance where we want it to be. Mm. It, it's easy. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just being honest because I, I got out of school and I, I was working and I was kind of done with, <laughs> sure, <laughs> with, sure, uh, I, I guess like academia and, and continuing to learn. I was like, I just want to work. I just want to see mm. people. And just kind of curled up in my little bubble and and just saw patients for a few years and then started to interact with people online and other professionals and then started to feel the tug to to think uh, bigger, I guess, in, in the sense uh -huh. of how, how can I impact the profession rather than just the patient in front of me. I love that. And I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not a hardcore. I'm not involved in any advocacy. I, I haven't contributed financially to the, the PT pack. I mean, I'm very ignorant to a lot of that stuff. It's, it's kind of sure. been. Uh, slow for me to to get involved in the APTA and in the home health section and whatnot, um, but yeah. I know for for that kind of three four year period, I definitely thought like, what in the world am I going to do? You know, like uh -huh. I'm I'm just one little PT from West Virginia. You know, my my efforts are going to be minimal. And then I start to talk to people like you, uh, like uh, D Cornetti, like Cindy Craft, uh, who are, have changed policies that that I felt in the day-to-day -day practice. So th this is a, a clear example. Cindy Craft talks about how she, her and several other people were a big voice to change um, the timing of reassessments in the home mm -hmm. health setting. Cause it used to be every, I think 13th and 19th therapy visit, you know, PTs had to do a reevaluation. And, mm -hmm. and that was the case when I started home health Yeah, and it made no sense whatsoever. I mean, we would, yeah. We would do an eval, and then literally within the next week, I would go back out, do a reevaluation, no objective changes whatsoever. I'm just like, why in the world are we doing this? And she, you know, and other people got that changed to 30 days, and and that's, I mean, that's just had such a big impact, in, I guess quality of life, <laughs> right, but also right. it just makes sense in terms of quality of care. And every home health therapist uh, owes Cindy and, and several other people a lot. Uh, for that, and that really motivated me to see that that we can make change, and that that there there is possibility in being in being involved. So I guess that rant is is leading to the question: What is um, 
what is a good way for someone to just kind of get their feet wet a little bit and get involved in yeah. being an advocate for the profession? I think, um, and you'll hear this from me and not a lot, but I'm a passionate APTA member. And I mm -hmm. think that's probably the easiest way to start, right? Yeah. Pay your dues, get, get involved or don't even, you don't even get involved to the extent that you want to get involved, but at least what I consider it to be a, an investment in your profession. Mm. That's why I say join APTA. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, you'll, you'll be exposed to various legislative issues um, via email and things like that. Peruse the website. Um, but on a sort of a relationship level, I say find your, in your state association, find out with uh, what district sort of you're affiliated with. So in St. Louis, we're the Eastern District of the Missouri Physical Therapy Association. Mm. They, they usually have, these districts usually have regular meetings. Find out when they are and go. Mm. Um, just see what it's like. And I have a, I suspect once you go, you'll be hopefully kind of hooked yeah. a little bit about because they'll present a lot of issues that you never thought about and realize that you can make a huge change. Mm. Um, so that what I would say would be the easy first step. And if you even to facilitate that, look up your district's website or your state association's website and see if you if they have sort of a mentoring program or someone that uh, like the president of that association might be able to put you in contact with somebody who lives close to you mm -hmm. um, who you can talk to about these issues and how to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you get involved? What was that? Uh, I guess what was the transformation like when you actually started to care about advocacy? Yeah. I, I did care a lot when I was a student as well. And I, I think the main reason is because I had faculty uh, who were role models for this. So they were very involved in our state association and frequently would go down to the Capitol in Missouri to testify mm -hmm. uh, at certain hearings about physical therapy related issues. And so that shows you right there that if, if these folks are invested who I learn from on a daily basis, then I think I need to be invested too. Mm -hmm. um, and then <clears throat> as I, I've gone on, one of the things that really got me sort of fired up working specifically with people with Parkinson's is the Medicare therapy cap, mm. right? So these people have a progressive degenerative condition um, and we know that they benefit from physical therapy, but yet we're going to set a specific dollar amount and say, after that, you're cut off. Mm. Now, I realize that since then there's been the Jimmo versus Sebelius law that covers maintenance therapy, yeah. but still um, I have patients to this day who will ask me, you know, on their first initial evaluation of the year when they haven't spent any Part B dollars, they're very worried about approaching that cap. And so it's a huge barrier mm. to um, good care because if they are worried about that, they're more likely to not come to therapy and then start this sort of vicious cycle of decline in motor performance. So, yeah. um, again, I think that's just really what got me fired up. And then once I got into that, I've learned just so much about many other issues and the importance of being involved and in helping to advocate for many different things um, in our profession. Mm. I bet you loved uh, hearing Dee Cornetti talk about maintenance therapy. I did. Uh, I learned a lot from it, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to talk with her more. So Dee, if you're listening, hit me up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I got I to gotta learn more about that. Um, because I see it a lot, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, so you just got back from, from DC, correct? I did, yeah. Um, at a, a APTA meeting. Yeah. Uh, what, you don't have to go into p specifics per se, but what has you really excited after, after, the, after that? Anything so that we, you all discussed we were there. or went down? Sure. Um, so I was at APTA this past weekend um, on behalf of the Missouri Physical Therapy Association uh, as the membership chair. Uh, it was a membership chair form, so membership chairs from all across the United States as well as the sections of APTA um, went and discussed how can we um, better recruit members, better retain members, um, and that was the major focus of this weekend. And I think, um, so the first day we were there, there was a consultant who did a lot of education related to um, building relationships and um, showing the 
features that APTA has to offer. And that was huge for me because that's what I've gotten most out of out of being involved with APTA is the relationships. You know, I've got more what I consider to be lifelong friends now simply because I got in this organization and uh, that's huge. So we really learned how to best sort of communicate that to people. Um, and then uh, on the second day was more of a tutorial on this, uh, the sort of system that we have available to us to better sort of communicate with our members to let them know what's going on. So I think it was huge. There are a lot of great ideas thrown around and what we're working on now, um, and we do it virtually through a sort of a forum, yeah. but trying to come up with uh, sort of tangible action plans that we can go forward with in hopes of growing APTA membership. That sounds like every business meeting I've ever been a part of. Great <laughs> ideas, having a tough time acting on them. Yeah. And <laughs> right, I think we've all challenge. realized that, right? Yeah. We, with Because ideas without action are really worthless, to yeah. be honest. And so we've come up with a few ideas that we thought were really important. And so now we're working on action plans to really uh, execute, yeah. right? So that's the most crucial part. And that's what we're going to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, and I can, I'll echo what you just said in terms of relationships. Um, cause I, I was not, I was a member in school. I was not active by any means. I let my membership lapse. I became a member again uh, last year. And then just within the year, uh, just meeting people, interacting with them and, and definitely, you know, with Twitter as well. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's insane. I, I just can't, I know I talk about it a ton on this podcast yeah. and, I'm sure it annoys people like crazy, but uh, I love it. You, you never you never grasp it until you actually experience it. And now being on the other side of of that is is just wild and and just so valuable. It, it's sure. it's definitely worth more than the money I paid. I'll tell you yes, that. That's for great. Sure. And I've only it's only so been let me a year, ask so. you. Let me ask you. I'm just curious because one of the things that we as membership chairs this past weekend um, we're on this forum now and we all are sharing with each other. <clears throat> sort of our why. So mm -hmm. why did you join? I'm curious to know what, so you, you let your membership lapse and then you decided to join. What, what, what sort of prompted that decision? So that it was in, it was in the summer and uh, I got on Twitter and mm -hmm. was interacting in, in a professional manner. And I was just starting to try strike up all these conversations with these people uh, on, you know, care for geriatric uh, patients and the consistent theme was a lot of them were active in in the APTA and mm -hmm. I really liked how they thought and and just their desire uh, to improve geriatric rehab and mm -hmm. and it was very infectious and that was a common thread amongst a lot of those people um, yeah and and you were one of them I remember I mean we mm -hmm. interacted pretty early on I mean I yeah. I, I didn't. I never met you or, or knew you mm -hmm. per se, but I know we interacted. And just to see that common thread, it's like, you know what, I, I need to do this. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it started there. Um, yeah, that's so, yeah. great. That's awesome. I mean, that's what it's, that's how a lot of things get started. And it's really about building a movement. And so mm -hmm. I just, I just like to hear everybody's story because again, when we try to figure out how to communicate the value of ABTA membership, everybody has a different reason for joining. Yeah. And so how do we best, you know, if somebody asks me why I should be a member, I need to be able to communicate it to them, but to try to make it individual. Yeah. So if I know you're a relationships person, then I can focus on that. Mm -hmm. If I know you're more worried about making sure that you get the, the physical therapy journal, then I can focus on that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, so it's cool. Thanks for sharing. Sorry to no. interview the interviewer. <laughs> no, but. you're not. You're not at all. This, this is a conversation. I wouldn't call yeah. it an interview by any means, but, yeah. but I remember uh, just before that, you know, I kind of viewed the the organization. I mean, this is very uninformed. I, sure. I'm, I'm a very ignorant person, but sure. but it's so easy to to think like, my gosh, they're asking for that much money, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, they're making a killing off of of members and and not doing much with it. That was my perception. Yeah. And sure, then absolutely. interacting with people on Twitter and just seeing how so many people that are, uh, you know, very involved and have a lot of re responsibility in the APTA and the different state uh, bodies in the sections, like they're getting after it. Like they're, right. they're, they're changing <clears throat> things and they're, they're making moves. And, yeah. and that's when I was like, yeah, this, this is worth it. And, right. and so, yeah, my perceptions are definitely changed. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, 
the cost issue comes up a lot. And uh, I think, one, you have to engage yourself to even a small amount to see the value. If you just pay and you expect something from it, you know, you may or may not see it yeah. uh, on a tangible side. But I will say the infrastructure that's needed to protect our profession is immense. Mm -hmm. So when you consider that a majority of your dues goes to uh, supporting lobbyist staff and various APTA staffs to stay on top of the legislative issues, I think that alone is crucial. Yeah. Um, again, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? Mm -hmm. And APTA gets us at the table. Man, I like that. That's awesome. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. Let's sure. uh, we'll wrap up things with some quick questions. Your responses do not have to be quick. Okay. Um, so you're you're fresh, thirty one years old. Mm -hmm. What would you tell the twenty five year old Ryan Duncan? Uh, I would say um, be okay with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So um, you're not going to have the answer to every question, uh, nor should you. Um, but take the time to figure it out if you don't. And also don't be afraid to communicate that to your patient. You know, I really don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to work as hard as I can to figure it out for you. Mm. Uh, and then my second piece of advice would be uh, treat every single patient on your schedule with every ounce of compassion that you have. So that, f that 5 o'clock patient on Friday deserves every bit of compassion that you gave to that 10 o'clock patient on Monday. Mm. But I got to get so, to happy hour, Ryan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just just leave your compassion on the field. Man. Yeah. <laughs> you, you the job. <laughs> that's that's awesome. What uh, what pieces of technology, apps, or equipment are helpful for you in your work? Let's let's focus on as a researcher and then also as a clinician. Sure. My smartphone has been huge, right? And the yeah. access to Twitter, yeah. because I can learn about studies that I've never seen before. Yeah. Um, and probably would have never seen on there. And then I can read the study and make an informed opinion myself. Um, so that's what, I, you know, it's as simple as having a smartphone, I think, is massive. Yeah. And you know what? The same goes for clinical practice, too. When, when I'm on there, the ability to interact with people and potentially bounce questions off of them, um, I think it's huge. Yeah. Again, that goes back to me not knowing the answer, but I'm going to work to figure it out. And I can use my colleagues mm -hmm. to help figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would echo that as well. What's been your most helpful continuing education course or books that you've read in your career? So my probably the most helpful continuing education course, uh, it was at CSM when it was in Chicago. And I forget if it was 2012 or 2013, but it was uh, given by Lee Dibble at the University of Utah and Terry Ellis, um, who's at Boston University. And it was on the um, examination um, and treatment of people with Parkinson's disease across the spectrum of the disease. Just so informative, um, helped open my eyes to all, all of the evidence related to, to PD. And um, Lee and Terry are fantastic speakers. So I suggest if you haven't had a chance to see them, please do it. Okay. And Terry, Terry Ellis has one of the most infectious personalities that you'll ever see. Um, if she can't get you fired up about uh, exercise and Parkinson's, then I think something's wrong with you. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, find a link to that and put that yeah. in the show notes as well. Okay, yeah. so last last question here. Let's say I guess I could give a, a little plug about that. So yeah, so I, I'm on. They they we gave that same course again this past year at CSM, and uh, um, uh, I'm a, I'm part of the faculty now with. Uh, several others, Stephanie Combs Miller at the University of Indianapolis and Jeffrey Hoder at, at Duke. And it's a regional course for the neurology, uh, sorry, Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy mm. now uh, at APTA. And so it'll be traveling around the country. And so if you're interested in learning about Parkinson's, check out the uh, Academy of Neurologic PT's website. It's neuropt.org. Okay. Uh, look for locations. I think there's one in San Francisco coming up in the fall, the same for Chicago. So awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll link that stuff for sure. Cool. All right. So last question here, sure. we're, we're at CSM and let's say we're at the Marriott bar where we spent, uh, 
a good amount of nights. Or was that the hill? Yeah. I can't remember which bar. I think it was, it was the Marriott. Marriott. It was the Marriott. <laughs> the hill bar was going crazy with that DJ. Yeah, that's those, that's where all the youngins were. <laughs> right. We're, we're across the street. So we're at the Marriott bar. You've got several geriatric rehab clinicians around drinking beers, and you have their attention. What would you want them to know? That's a great question. Um, so I would say, again, this is specific to people with PD, but they're not fragile. So you're able to push them. And a lot of times it might simply come down to you being a cheerleader or a, a, a motivational coach. And you can push these people. Again, use your judgment. If they don't respond well to what you did when you push them, then you know what? Back off a little bit. But if they tolerated it well, then you know that you can you can progress their exercise. Yeah. And then lastly, as I, I would tell anybody, um, get involved in your profession. Invest in your profession because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Boom. <laughs> and you drop the mic or you chug your beer drop either mic. one right. <laughs> exactly they had some good beer out there they did the they did we sampled a few uh yeah. ryan duncan thank you for your time if people yeah. uh, want to pick your brain a little bit where can they find you on the twitter sphere sure my hat my handle is uh at ryan duncan pt um you can also uh, if you want i you can put my email address up and i'm happy to chat with anybody okay um, email so. all right yeah i'll link that in the show notes so i appreciate your time sir appreciate uh, you sharing your passion for advocacy and and challenging me challenging the listeners and yeah. and yeah just making things happen and uh yeah. you know pushing our profession forward and trying to get the table because if not yeah. we're gonna be on the menu i love it i love it thanks for inviting me dustin i really appreciate it Hit me. I appreciate you listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The show notes can be found at SeniorRehabProject.com as well as some other helpful services and products that are offered at a discounted rate to you, the amazing people that listen to the Senior Rehab Podcast. So until next time, my friends, please do not forget to stay funky. <laughs>